teach English abroad. You could see the world, meet tons of cool people, and get paid in the process. Look, maybe you're feeling stuck in a routine. Maybe you just want to take a year off. Or maybe you're just looking for a little bit of adventure in your life. This is a great opportunity to develop leadership skills, overcome that fear of public speaking, and form friendships that could last a lifetime. So what's the best way to gather information? Talk to someone who's been through it. David Young runs a four-week intensive teacher trainer course in Prague, Czech Republic. He's going to tell us how you can do this with your life. This is the ISO. I'm here with Lewis Risk. And our guest today is the course director of Oxford Deffel in Prague. His name is David Young, originally from the UK. Thanks for joining us today, David. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I want to get right into it. Let's start with your background. So can you tell us what it was like growing up in the UK? Uh, it depends a lot on which part of the UK, but... Well, where exactly were you born and where did you live? Yeah, okay. So I was, I was born in Scotland, moved to the north of England at a relatively young age, and was there and basically until 23, 24 years old. Uh, what it did mean was the time I was there was uh, when Thatcher came to power. So, <laughs> um, in some ways, that's what it was like growing up in the in the UK, leaving school was, um, what are you going to do next? Um, and the answer for a lot of people was go on the dole. Um, go on the dole. Go on the dole. Collect unemployment benefits. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Us Americans don't understand uh -huh. <laughs> these terms. Well, now you do. All right. On Always the, learn and stuff. On, on the doll. Yeah. So, so that was a lot of people's, that's a lot of people's life. As I kind of hit 16, Thatcher was there. She was there for a long time. Uh, through the time I was at university. Um, for me, that meant I didn't really know what to do and didn't really want to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps that was the start of me growing up in the UK. It was the start of me wanting to get out of the UK. <laughs> well, did you have any jobs there? Like first couple of jobs, what were you doing? I, I did quite a lot of jobs. I was painting, decorating. I was doing bar work. Um, I worked as a draftsman in a, a glazing company. So basically some big shop wants their windows replacing. I did the drawings and told the people how, how long a piece of aluminium to measure to pick the windows. Door-to-door um, -to -door salesman. Uh, I door guess door. I'd forgotten that one, actually. A lifeguard at a swimming pool, a wow. newspaper delivery. I did kind of all the, the classics, I guess. Well, how do you go from all that to teaching English? From wanting out, I think. Uh -huh. yeah, having, having finished university and, okay, I, I graduated with... Um, basically a, a diploma in hotel catering management um, having originally started with civil engineering both of which I realized I didn't want to do mm. kind of civil engineering I looked around and thought I'm okay at this the, the, the math or the maths was easy enough but um, do I really want to do something just because it's easy uh, so I couldn't really see myself sitting in an office with a bunch of other civil engineers drawing sewage pipes or whatever and designing bridges for, for motorways or whatever. Um, so moving into hotel catering seemed, well, that's a more sociable kind of field to work in. But having finished all that, I thought, who wants to work in a hotel or in a restaurant? Some do, but for me, I didn't see kind of work in weekends, work in evenings is fitting with what I like to do, which was going out to concerts and whatever. Um, so a lot of that was like, well, there's nothing here for me. What am I going to do with this? Um, and really all I knew was I wanted to get out of the UK. So that's where the teaching comes in. It's, it's an obvious route to living in a different country and being able to support yourself. So it wasn't actually the teaching itself that attracted you. It was a desire to escape the UK. Definitely, yeah. Teach, teach, teaching wasn't even on the radar for me. My mm. my mum was a teacher, okay, but I I never for a second thought I'd be following in her footsteps. Um, to be honest, I hated uh, school. 
I, I didn't particularly like university, so there's a certain irony to be turning into a teacher and spending my entire life in academia. Um, for me, it was simply a way to, to get out of the UK and to, to be able to support myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've met a lot of teachers in your day, and you seem to have the characteristics of a good teacher. What would you say those are that make a good teacher? It's a good one because that's basically asked. We, we was doing the, the, the one month cert TESOL course. That's a question that I guess get asked every month. Mm -hmm. And what does that stand for? CERT TESOL is the Certificate in Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. Mm -hmm. So that's the Trinity accredited course. TEFL course, CELTA is the Cambridge one. So it's the idea of this one month intensive course mm -hmm. to become an English language teacher. Um, I've kind of forgotten what the actual question was there. The qualities of a good teacher. The qualities of a good teacher. Yeah, so these guys come in on the course month after month. They do a pre-course task and in there they're asked to ask me any questions they've got. And that's a very frequent one. Um, I change my mind kind of month to month, day to day. Uh -huh. But the ones that come up a lot are being a good listener um, and being able to establish a rapport with people much more so than knowing the names of tenses or, mm -hmm. or the language. That stuff will come as you're teaching it. Um, but I think it's that idea, if you don't listen to your students in the first place to work out what they're trying to say, you've got no hope of actually helping them to say what it is they want. So I think that's, that's kind of up there as the, the number one, probably. Flexibility. Um, and kind of accepting that Things are not, not going to go as you want them to go. Um, even on this month's course, the classes I observed today and yesterday, um, the, the classes were fine, but things happen in there for the, the trainee teachers that they're not expecting. They've planned, they've worked everything out, they've got their question they're going to ask, they've got the answer they're expecting. But when you're dealing with human beings, they're not <laughs> going to respond in the way that you anticipate right so that ability to kind of okay well that's not what i expected and to quickly change the plan yeah. it is fine it's great to have a plan there but you've got to be able to be flexible and adapt to what it is your students need again that goes back to listening and, and, and working out what that is yeah. and do you get a sense of fulfillment from this job helping the, all these people i mean you've met thousands of people what, what is it that keeps you doing this a guy that's worked every job imaginable. It, it, it is a good question. I mean, there's that thing of how did I get into it? Um, kind of by chance, because I came on holiday to, to Prague and I met someone on the plane who um, said they were coming over to get a job teaching English. And I thought, oh, yeah, great, fine. And how old are you at this point? I was 23 or 24, I think, at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, I was just coming over on a holiday. I was doing like reconnaissance. Um, so I had a holiday in Spain and stayed with some friends and then I had a holiday in Germany and mm -hmm. stayed with some friends. Picking out the best spot. Trying to work out where am I going to go? I'm, I'm leaving the country, but where am I going to go? Mm -hmm. And then I thought, I'll go somewhere where I don't know anyone, where I know nothing. Uh, and there were some cheap flights through the kind of student travel agency to Prague. Um, it was actually 129 pounds, which is quite expensive <laughs> now because <laughs> no, that was one way. Right. Right? <laughs> um, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just go to this this Prague place and see what it's all about. Um, I say I met these people on the same plane who were coming over to, to teach English uh, and then met them like three or four days later in a pub. I kind of asked them, you know, oh, 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 so how's it going with that English teaching malarkey then? <laughs> um, and she said, oh yeah, I got a job uh, with an apartment. Um, I'm like, but hang on, this, this sounds pretty good. Uh, I can just turn up and teach English. Just and speak English to people? And you, you, you give me a <laughs> I mean, that's what I asked her. It's like, well, how does this, how does this work? And she's going, yeah, you just te speak English to people. I'm like, <laughs> it, it can't really be that simple. And she goes like, well, uh, they, they might ask you difficult questions. Uh, like, well, what like? You know, she said, well, what is the present continuous? I said, like, I don't know, I, I, am, I am drinking beer. And she said, yeah. I was like, great, I'm obviously a natural at this. Um, so I did, that's when I went back to the UK, did a kind of 
initial course there and came back a month later. And that was that was your decision, or she, the person you were talking to, uh, said that it's better if you had a, a little bit of a background in in it how was, to teach English. It was my decision. I mean, I was there on holiday, so I knew I was going back to the UK, and I still had a flat full of nonsense there. So <laughs> um, basically, that's what I did. I, I went back, did the course, uh, packed all my stuff in the van, and took that to my parents. And said, um, "I'm going, and I won't be back <laughs> ever." Uh, <laughs> My mum still reminds me of that moment and how it's like, uh, uh, the tears are going. I lost um, my son. I do, I do remember saying it's like, well, I should be in Tahiti in 10 years, <laughs> um, which didn't happen. But I did meet a guy from Tahiti. Uh, it didn't happen yet. Didn't happen. I yeah, don't yeah. think it's going to happen now because I'm quite comfortable here. But um, yeah, that, that was the start of the teaching. And then um, it all seemed quite comfortable for me. It was felt like I was okay at it. Students seemed happy, you know, they came to class. They came back again the month after, so I must have been doing something right. You definitely are. You definitely are. Now, you mentioned uh, flexibility and patience, listening ability. From your experience, are those things that you can develop? Have you seen people develop these skills, or is it more of a personality trait? I, I've seen myself develop it. Mm -hmm. um, I see trainees de develop it in the course. I don't think there's any reason why any individual sh should find it impossible to be flexible. They might have their structures or their ideas of how things should be and find it difficult to break that. But it's always doable. Um, I mean, even if I think back to kind of my own experience in, in just the job of course direction and the teacher training, I'd say I'm, I'm a lot better, and my colleagues who have been with her a long time, we're a lot better now than we were five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, because um, we've met different situations. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we can go back to kind of the old days when we were in another school, and you know, the IT guy used to come around telling us, you know, make sure people log off the PCs, and that became a fixation. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, they haven't logged off the PCs. How are we going to punish these trainees for not logging off the PCs? What are we going to do about it? And then you start to realize, well, who cares? Mm. Really, who cares? They may have left their email open. Close it. And well, care a little bit. <laughs> yeah, sure, you can close that. But ultimately, that's their responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a very concrete uh, scenario of just, just changing your mind. And thinking, There's no reason for it to be that way. And I think just the, the number of people who've come through the course is probably around 2,000 over the past 15 years here in Prague. Um, you know, everybody's different. Every student you teach is different. You may have lots of uh, strategies and ideas for how to teach something or how something's done, but it doesn't mean they haven't actually got a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. Even if that's you know, a pre-intermediate student telling another pre-intermediate student something that I should have 20 plus years of experience in doing, maybe they can do it better anyway. Mm -hmm. now, now you're watching people who have never taught before teach classes of about 20 people in a foreign country they've never been to. You, have, you must have seen some just horrible lessons. I mean, can you tell us about some of the trainees that were just the worst of the worst? The worst of the worst. Uh, in terms of the cla class? In terms of anything, actually. You, you're kind of living with these people for a month, whatever it is. There's, there's people who have other problems and issues in their life, um, which I think are nothing to do with us. They brought baggage to the course. Um, the guy who thought the CIA was following him and <laughs> kind of every restaurant he went into, he, the, the, place was reserved even though there was nobody sitting there and it's like this is obviously the CIA um, <laughs> that they planted a microphone in his tooth <laughs> which you know if they had they were listening to our conversation but I, th I think that, that kind of baggage is I'm not a psychologist that's somebody who needs help outside of teacher training um, on the class side, sometimes, as you say, some of these people have never taught before, have maybe never really stood in front of a group of people and addressed 
you know, public speaking before. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times nerves get in the way, which leads to the teacher talking and then they see a lot of blank, blank expressions. So talk some more. Um, and you end up just watching the teacher standing at the front of the class speaking for 40 minutes uh, with the students not really involved. But that's fixable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a different kind of thing. Again, there's times where you see a class being taught and you think, well, this is the wrong way to go about it. You know, pre-teaching stuff that doesn't need teaching or, or bringing in language that isn't a part of the class. Um, but again, that's just part of the loop of, okay, we sit down, we look at it afterwards and fix stuff, uh, help people see where it went wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this organization, Oxford TEFL, uh, how did you get involved with Oxford TEFL? And uh, after you came here, were you teaching all alone, trying to find your own students or how did that okay. work? Um, actually, I, I taught in Prague for four and a half years. Um, and that was still when I kind of felt I didn't really know what I was doing or <laughs> how did I get this? How did I get this job? It's, I am drinking beer is, was the most important thing. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you realize your life calling in a bar, basically. <laughs> That's what Some, gathered Something so along far. those lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's also in, in this industry, there's a lot of, why do people do this job? People come into it because they want to travel, mm -hmm. but don't have an interest in teaching maybe a little like I started out. Uh, some people are doing it as a second career. Some people do the course who are already teachers and they didn't do a qualification to start with but realize they want to firm up their knowledge. Other people have a clear idea, this is what I want to do. But certainly back in 93 when I came here, most of the people who were teaching my school were like me, probably didn't have a certificate, may have had the the weekend TEFL course from the International TEFL School of Ireland. Hmm. <laughs> that was the classic. Um, and didn't really treat it as a job. Uh, and neither did I. Mm -hmm. It was... Just to make a little bit of money. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you got a lot of people who would do a year and go back and get a, a real job. Mm -hmm. um, or people who drifted off to another country and carried on doing the, the joke job in a different setting. And at some stage, along the line. I'd actually moved from Prague to Barcelona. Um, and at that stage, I, I met with Sean, my colleague, and started to take the job a bit more seriously, which meant mm. starting to take myself a bit more seriously, that although I'm enjoying this, it is a job. You know, it, it meets the definition of a job. I, I get up in the morning, whatever, I, I go to a place, I, I perform a service, and I get paid for it at the end of the month. It's like, well, why isn't this a job? And they're the only thing I could see as a, not being a job because it's not the best paid job in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so there was an element of, you know, you're kind of living month to month and you're wondering, okay, you, in Spain there was a nice long summer holiday, but you're going, well, what am I going to spend during that <laughs> summer holiday? Uh, and that's pretty much when I decided to do the diploma level qualifications. That's a level seven in the UK qualifications. Um, so it's like master's level. Mm -hmm. Uh, to take the job seriously, to take myself seriously. And I had a friend who was in teacher training. I'd asked him for a job. And he said, well, you need the diploma. Um, so I kind of did it for that. And I did the diploma through Oxford TEFL oh. uh, in Barcelona. Mm. So that was my first contact with them. Um, I was clear on my motivations for doing it, that I wanted to go into teacher training. So. Once I'd completed it, two or three months down the line, uh, the owner of the company called me up and said, we've got some work teacher training. It's like, great. Because the guy who had uh, said get the qualification was no longer in a position to offer me a job anymore. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so the Oxford TEFL did. So I started working in the teacher training with them in Barcelona, um, doing a little bit more and a little bit more each month and doing some of the input sessions as well as the observing of teaching. And then they decided to open a branch in Prague. So that was the obvious moment for me to go, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go back there. I had some 
slightly ludicrous fantasy that I would spend six months in Prague and six months in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. like, why, why ludicrous? Um, it just doesn't work like that? It, life just doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, yeah. It's possible because that guy that was doing the teacher training before, mm -hmm. He actually, to this day, still does an element of that. He teaches in San Francisco, uh, teaches at Berkeley and the University of oh, wow. California, San Francisco, doing academic writing there. Um, and he, to this day, does basically most of the year in San Francisco, but he spends a month or two in Barcelona every year. He used to still work and do stuff while he was there. It, he doesn't do so much work now. It's more, more his holiday. Um, but again, there was this picture of, yeah, I can, what could be better? Winters in Spain and then spend spring, summer, and autumn in Prague uh, and then run away for the cold again. Did the, did the owner consult you before making that decision to open up a new branch in Prague or how, how did that work? No, just, it, out of, it, just coincidence. It, it came about Barcelona and Prague are both big centers in teacher training for the simple reason that they're both attractive places for people to come. You know, if you're, if you're sitting in the States and think, right, I want to go and travel the world, and I've heard about this teaching English stuff, it's not so likely you're going to kind of spin the globe and go, I really want to go to Minsk in, Bia <laughs> in Belarusia. Yeah, that's, that's where I really want to be. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of look around and Bali sounds good and mm -hmm. Barcelona sounds good right. and Prague. These are all names that yeah, friends have been on holiday to and said is they there, were Is wonderful. there a teacher training center in Bali? There is. Seriously? Yeah, there Oxford is. Oxford TEFL opened up a branch Not, there? <laughs> we, we, have, we have an associate course in India. Really? Uh, in Kerala. Oh. There is a Trinity course in Bali, um, but it's nothing to do with us. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's another organization. But the, let's say the fact that they opened up a place in Prague just was out of the blue for me. Um, yeah. In order to answer the question, of why is it a fancy to live in two places, who's paying the rent? Yeah. Right on. Um, sure, you can get people in whilst you're away, but that's always difficult trying to organize. Yeah, you can have this flat for five months, but I'll need you out on the mm -hmm. 1st of October because I'll be coming back. Um, and then you need, you, need, you need two washing machines. You need, two, you need two of everything. So quickly I realized that wasn't so doable. You mentioned the money earlier. You said uh, in, in Prague in particular, the salaries aren't so good. Where is it lucrative to teach financially? In, in terms of like, lucrative is a hard word because it's whether you're talking on a global scale. In which, I am talking on a global scale. Yeah. In that case, you're looking at Middle East, Japan, South Korea are mm. kind of the three big hitters for these are places you can earn a big salary. Is it hard to find jobs there though? Um, it's not hard to find jobs. Korea is huge as long as you are quite happy teaching young learners. Uh, Middle East will be slightly harder. Um, in, in terms of they may have specific nationality requests. There may be specific gender requests. Um, if you're going to Saudi Arabia to teach in a women's college, you need to be a woman. Right. Mm -hmm. um, although, I do know a woman who went to Syria um, to teach to teach there, um, but that was just general English in a company, basically. Uh, Japan's the difficulty there is uh, qualifications that you need to have a degree, definitely, just to meet the, uh, yeah, the university degree. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like with some some place, for instance, in the Czech Republic, you don't necessarily need a degree to be able to teach English mm -hmm. if you've done a certificate like the Cert TESOL, then there are jobs out there. But I think the, J the Japan thing or places like Bahrain, um, Brunei, Singapore, their visa re requires that there's a degree there. So they basically just don't let anyone in to mm. do anything. Right. Unless people who believe that the CIA are after them and uh -huh. planting chips uh -huh. in their, in their <laughs> faces. <laughs> And then places like India, really, really hard to actually work legally in, in a place like India. So with the, the school out there, we actually have a system um, that will give you a teaching job, but it's unpaid. Yeah. Oh, because they it's give you accommodation. Right. 
Yeah. So you're given a stipend for mm-hmm. living. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, read into that what you want, but the, the actual idea of having a contract, you're an English teacher, you work for our company, that's never going to happen in India. Mm-hmm. But this kind of ongoing training, uh, mentored teaching um, with a stipend for a living uh, is a way that that's still possible. Yeah. Um, I guess the other side of the loop is that there's also places where you might not save money on a global scale, but you can save money for the place you're in. So places like Turkey are very good for that. You probably won't come out of Turkey rich, but you'll have quite a lot of money for living in Turkey. Right. And I guess there's even an element of that in Prague that there are plenty of jobs here that don't don't pay very much. Uh, it's why a lot of people leave. Um, mm. But then you'll find all the people who've stuck around who have been here year after year. Uh, they're working for more. You know, they are actually getting a, a decent enough salary. And it helps if they have a certificate from Oxford TEFL, for example. Obviously. Yeah. 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 What could be better? Yeah. yeah. Um, what could be better? Yeah. Talk to us about uh, the Oxford TEFL course itself. Like, how, how long is it? What do you do here? It's a, it's a, Four week certificate, so you're, you're in the school pretty much for four weeks. Uh, it's intensive because that is a short time. And so, what, what kind of hours are we talking about? You've got the hours on the timetable. So, f- for today, for example, it was nine o'clock till four fifteen, mm-hmm. um, which doesn't seem that bad, you know. We've got but it's all, all day learning. You've got right? a lunch hour in there as well. Right. What they'll be doing, two thirds of that is actually on the teaching side, on the practical side. It's planning classes, it's talking them through with a tutor, it's teaching the students. So there's groups of real live students in the classroom. Not robots. Not robots. Not yet. No. <laughs> The, the, the bigger Just worry, wait. the bigger worry is, will the robots replace <laughs> me? Not will the robots replace the students? Exactly. Yeah. Um, Be afraid. <laughs> well, the, what we the, it's getting sidetracked, but there was a, a conference in Brno this year, and, and, and part of the discussion headed a little bit that way. That what what is the role of the teacher these days? Mm-hmm. Because so much can be done by AI. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah? Um, there's lots of programs, even things like Grammarly or Cambridge has right, right. Write and Improve. Um, I think Google just came out with a, a translatable earpiece, uh-huh, uh-huh, something uh-huh. like that. Yeah. So, so yeah, who needs a teacher? <laughs> but things like the Cambridge Write and Improve, that's very specific towards helping students with their writing skills to pass Cambridge exams, such as first certificate. Mm-hmm. Um, and so th- that's basically a, a program you write in your text. Um, and it gives you feedback instantly on, you know, you might want to check the spelling of this word. Uh, are you sure you want to be using present tense here? Um, the nice thing, because it's artificial, artificial intelligence, is it never quite knows if it's right or not. Mm-hmm. So that's where I was kind of clinging on, going like, yeah, that's I, I do can, still have yeah. a job, because the, the AI always has to hedge its bets. It depends on, on how it's programmed. Right. Well, it, the way it's programmed is fascinating as well, but um, there's people who could tell you more about that than I ever could. <laughs> um, but it's, it's based on a constant feedback loop. So mm-hmm. the more people that actually write an essay into it, the oh, bigger the database it. it has to compare against. Mm-hmm. So if, if the task is, you know, write, a, write an essay on the, a day in the life of a submarine, then the the computer will actually get quite good at handling essays on the day of life in a submarine. Did you actually write an essay about that? I didn't, but I talked <laughs> to one of the guys who was working on the, on the program, and it, this is the kind of thing he was saying. If you actually go in and write a day in the life of uh, a, a microphone, mm-hmm. the, the AI kind of freaks out and doesn't know right. how to deal with it, because mm-hmm. nobody's ever written about microphones. Well, what is it talking about? It doesn't have the vocab kind of bank to... To go, oh, that's a good word. That's not such a good word. So there's still a use for human teachers. But that's it. Okay. Because, because the feedback from that is always safe for the next five years. Yeah, yeah, are you exactly. sure you want to capitalize that? <laughs> then there's still the need to go like, yeah, yeah, go. you're fine. That yeah. should be capitalized. Because mm-hmm. the guy who was working on it, um, I wish I could remember his name, Philip Kerr. So he did a lot of course book writing. So he gave the talk in Brno. Um, 
and he was saying, you know, he, uh, as part of the work he was doing on it, he was writing essays into it. Um, and a lot of times the AI is coming back and telling him that he's a, a B1 learner, so an intermediate English speaker, whereas you know, he's, he's, fluent and, he's an yeah. native speaker and he writes <laughs> course books for teaching English. Um, mm -hmm. But again, that's because the, the AI actually wasn't able to cope with how good his English was, okay. mm -hmm. especially when he attempted to do a low-level task, because then the AI actually expects a, a low-level user. So a high-level a high user yeah. writing a low-level task, again, the AI couldn't cope with what was there and was suggesting to him, although the program's called Write and Improve, um, he talked about the program in, in his essay that he wrote into it mm -hmm. and then the program's coming back to him saying are you sure you want to capitalize the word right this is a verb which is not normally capitalized right of course this is the name of the program so speaking of um you know getting back to the, the grammar part how much uh, grammar do you teach here to trainees, to the trainees on this course right, right. there's kind of a a fairly comprehensive overview of grammar. Um, it, it's not the be all and end all, because when people think about grammar and coming into the course, right. they afraid. think, oh, I've got to know all the tenses, <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I need to know all these parts of speech, what the heck is a conditional? Um, and those are those discrete areas of grammar that um, are kind of the obvious ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and also they've all got horrible names, so they're confusing for people and they stress about it more than they should whereas the reality of I think being out there and teaching is recognizing the inherent grammar in everything we say not just being able to pick out well this is present continuous or that's a passive voice but when a student says um, uh, I am trying stop smoking I say, okay, well, something's wrong there. What, what is it the student needs to know? Okay, they need to know that after the verb try, uh, they need the full infinitive or <laughs> something else. And even there you get the, the kind of try smoking uh, or try to smoke. So there's a subtle difference between <laughs> those two. Mm -hmm. and so, I think the hard thing is actually recognizing that it's everywhere, the grammar regardless if you walk in for just a conversation class with no real big grammar aim, mm -hmm. it's going to be there. Yeah. And then I guess the more, it's a classic, the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. right. You mentioned young learners. And I wanted to ask you the difference between teaching adults and children. Yeah. For me personally, I like teaching adults, mm -hmm. and, I that? and I don't really like <laughs> teaching young learners. Uh -huh. So that, that's a kind of a clear one for me. Um, why is that? I don't know. I, I guess I was always hopeless with the discipline side of things. Um, so I think that's helped me make my choices in what I taught. I taught young learners when I was in Barcelona. I had a, got a nice job, well paid. Um, some private school doing the after hours English. It's like kindergarten children or how old? The first class I had there was like the 14 to 16 year olds. Oh, okay. Um, and I thought, okay, this will be great. I'll be cool. I know what I'm doing. I can handle this. And <laughs> you're riding you're, on a skateboard. I mean, you're, kind of, you're kind of in there and they're kind of all chatting. They're not listening to me. They don't care. And, you know, they don't want to be my friend, even if I want to be their friend. So <laughs> and it just felt like a hopeless banging my head against the wall. I didn't have the skills. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I wasn't even that interested in learning the skills. I, I'd already done a lot of teaching with adults, which I really enjoyed. And then teaching these kids, um, that was the only time in, in teaching where I had the pattern in my head, you know, as I'm getting ready to go to work, I'm going, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. And my partner at the time telling me, it's like, you've got to go to school. You're the teacher. <laughs> it's like, ah. Oh. Um, so I think I just really found that discipline side hard. Um, I enjoyed that inquisitiveness from older learners and that kind of analyzing language. 
which the kids are never going to do at younger ages. It's about modeling for them, motivating them to say anything, and kind of lots of repetition and pattern building. Um, with those teenagers, actually, actually one of the most interesting ones was uh, there was one day, there was a, like a Jesuit school, and all these kids had gone away on some retreat for the week, apart from uh, Francisco and Nacho. Yeah, I'll, I'll name some names here. They, I, <laughs> I remember them Nacho. well. And, and Nacho, th these are the only two guys who turned up for this class. Uh, Nacho was the kind of cheeky one the whole year, troublemaker. Um, and Francisco was, yeah, he's, he's kind of a slightly more studious guy. Um, but Nacho goes, because there's only two of them there, he, he goes, so, uh, class is cancelled today, we can go home, yeah? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, sorry, Nacho, that's not how it works. Um, <laughs> you know, sorry, you, Nacho. Yeah, you, your parents expect me, expect you to be here, so, you know, we're stuck with each other. Um, let's just get on with it. And somehow we, we did a role, role reversal. He's like, I was like, you know, if you want, you can teach the class. And so Nacho got up and, and started to teach the class. And I sat down with Francisco and started kind of just chatting, hit, hitting him on the <laughs> elbow and talking to him and, and acting like Nacho, um, which I thought this will this will show him like what he looks like and how kind of no know, empathy at all. It's a bit disrespectful <laughs> stuff. Meanwhile, of course, Nacho's up at the front of the class, this very small class, going. Uh, stop talking, stop talking, speak English, speak English. What did, you, what, did you, what did you say, what did you say? And I saw all this paranoia that obviously they'd had for the last six months of me going, because all these kids are speaking Catalan or whatever. Um, and, or whatever, <laughs> maybe. Spanish, Catalan, yeah, whatever, whatever it was. There was a, a girl from the Basque country as well, oh, although wow. she probably wasn't speaking Basque because none of the others were from the Basque country. So did that make you realize how yeah. you look to them? Oh, it was terrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because it's like, that is me. This, this isn't kind of some false me. That is exactly what I've done wow. for six months. Going, what are you saying? What are you saying? You guys, speak English. Speak English. Uh -huh. um, and to be honest, in some ways, that was kind of the death knell for me. It's like, I get, I'll finish up the year, but I'm, I'm, I'm moving to moving so the adults. So Nacho is really trying to help you. He, he, yeah. he is perhaps one of the biggest influences on my, my career path. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. Who knows what Nacho's doing these days? This good question. It's on his way to be you know, the, the presidency or prime minister somewhere. Yeah. Of, of Catalonia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. the new state. He's right exactly. now. Yeah. He could be sitting in, <laughs> sitting in jail He's in Madrid. Madrid. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. That was quite a long time ago. That was 18 years ago. Mm. So he'll be mid-30s. Oh, wow. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm curious. Uh, so someone who wanted to uh, take the teacher training course, what would he need to know or would he uh does he do um like an interview with you or how does that work uh obviously the first thing they need to know is english <laughs> okay so yeah. okay uh, so even non-native speakers can uh, non-native speakers <clears throat> roughly 25 percent of our intake these days is non-native okay so this month we've got an italian we've got a couple of russians there's a czech girl there there's mm -hmm. a french girl there so, so we don't need to be completely fluent um, you need to have uh, advanced English. So mm -hmm. Having done some kind of international uh, exam, such as IELTS or TOEFL mm -hmm. uh, or Cambridge Advanced, to show that you've got that level is useful. Mm -hmm. uh, not essential, because you can prove you have a good standard mm -hmm. of English by doing the interview. Uh, and then basically, it's, it's apply. All the applications are online these days, so you'd fill an application, you'd do some writing as part of that. So that already gives us a, a sample of written English to say, well, this person needs to be studying a bit more before they come on the course. If, and that's not just for non-native speakers. Yeah, there's times even with oh, right, people yeah. from the UK, from the States, and I just think, mm -mm. I mean, one thing is we ask, we ask people, write 200 words, mm -hmm. and then you get somebody who writes two sentences of about 52 words, and you think, why didn't they do what they were asked to do right. is the first question. Um, and then they'd go through an interview procedure talking. We normally do the interviews by Skype. Um, it just discusses their expectations of the course, what they hope to get out of it. Uh, it looks a bit into some English language problems. So kind of 
looking at typical mistakes students make and what the student might need to know there. Uh, and also just a chance to ask any questions they've got. Uh, as you say, it's like it's leaving your country often. It's going to live somewhere new uh, to do something you've never done before. So quite often it's, it's as much about their questions for me as the other way around. Uh, then we do some more live writing and, and there's a pre-course task to do before actually starting the, the attendance part, mm -hmm. the face-to-face -face here in Prague. And that's all done basically through a virtual learning environment mm. uh, online. And how can these trainees get a job afterwards? Do you guys help them with that or is there a resource? It's, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of it will depend on where they want to teach. Oh yeah, right. Uh, some people know, some people don't know. Obviously a lot of people coming here to Prague have chosen here because they fancy working here. Uh, in which case our main job is just to put them in touch with schools. Um, the language schools in Prague certainly know who we are, so they come to us mm -hmm. saying, we need teachers, have you got any? Um, and uh, there's a little bit of that matching up, like even somebody without experience may know that they want to teach business English or young learners or exam prep, or they may have an idea already. So that can also influence who, uh, Rachel who does the careers here now, who she'll link up. So she might think, well, you know, Jim would probably be better off with this school that fits his profile more, whereas Madeline might be better with... Oh, people like, you know, who are teaching little nachos everywhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and then that career support's ongoing and becomes, like the teachers who are out there, they also become a great resource as well because they might be moving on to another country, so they Mm, they yeah. contact us and say, I'm leaving, this is a pretty good gig here, your trainees might appreciate it. Or they feel a bit guilty because, you know, they said they were going to be here till June and they decided they're going to take off in March, so they feel a bit of responsibility to kind of fill their teaching slots. Again, they'll come back, they'll come back to us. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other people who've done, done the course, been teaching for years and manage schools, run schools, own schools around the world. So that's quite a nice thread, if you like, you know, if, if you've seen good and, you know, fancy going to Vietnam, I know where I'd recommend you go. <laughs> right. And for you personally, any regrets? Um, no, no, none. Great. Yeah. I can't, I can't think of, it's, it's the best decision I made was getting out of the country when I did. Uh -huh. Yeah. I say I found something I enjoyed doing. I still enjoy doing it. What's to regret? Right on, right on. Okay, final words. Do you have any uh, advice for people out there who are looking for something meaningful to do with their life? <laughs> do it. <laughs> um, it's a, this. This is certainly something meaningful. You, I, I'm not producing kind of wasteless consumer rubbish. So you're helping people to have a skill that can ultimately help them um, and earning your way by doing it. So I think for me, this is a very meaningful job, whether on the teaching side, whether on the training side. Um, if this is like teaching English is a route you're thinking about, it may or it may not be for you, um, but you'll find that out. And in some ways it's there is an expense in terms of your time, your energy, and of course money to come and do a course like this. But it's not the biggest expense ever. Um, it's a relatively easy way into something new and quite exciting, really. Sounds great. So uh, also for people who are interested in uh, taking the TEFL course here, how, how would they get started? Um, Go online, OxfordTeffel.com is where we are, uh, and apply for the course. You can read a lot of information on the website about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it sounds good, then send in an application. That costs you nothing. You'll get to talk to me again. <laughs> uh, are you the one who does the interviews? 90 plus percent of interviews I do, yeah. All right. Yeah. This is the guy you'll be talking to. Occasionally I go on holiday, but... Uh -huh. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, on that note... David Young, thanks for being with us. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for having Much me. Much appreciated. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Do This With Your Life. 
Now, I've got a question for you. Do you know anyone specifically that you think this episode could help? If so, please share this podcast with that person. The purpose of this show is to help people overcome challenges, solve problems, and take the next step in life. If you think that's a worthy cause, please visit our website, dothispodcast.com, and click on the button to become a patron of our show. Any little donation helps. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. There you can follow us, you can leave comments, ideas for future shows, and receive notifications every time we release an episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember, you are the reason we do this podcast.